Salam alaikum. Did you know that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, had a secret scientific research center? Yes, it specialized in biology, medicine, botany, and zoology. At least this will be the only explanation an atheist will come up with by the end of this video if he insists on rejecting God altogether. I will go through 20 miracles in the Quran and Hadith, and then you decide if this information is from God or did Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, come up with this information from his secret research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century. So get ready, bring your coffee, and let's start. In our last video, the Prophet's secret ultrasound machine, we talked a lot about the myth and false science that was believed in in the 7th century. We are not going to repeat that now. So if you missed it, I will leave a link to it in the description. Check it out. What we are interested in now is only one of them, the number of joints in the human body. Let's read from sources of Chinese tradition, Columbia University Press. Scroll down with me to page 276. It says, in the year there are 365 days, and human beings have 365 joints. But our prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, disagreed with that theory. He said the human has only 360 joints, not 365. Every one of you has 360 joints. Every day you should do one good deed for each one of them. So you should do 360 good deeds per day. Anyway, that was a test for the early Muslims because for them, to believe in what the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, was saying, they will have to disbelieve the surgeons of their era. Keep in mind that Chinese medicine was very reputable back then. Of course, they succeeded in their test and ignored everything that did not fit with the teachings of the Prophet. And they stayed like that until the advancement of medicine and medical equipment. This is Nature magazine. Of course, you already know it's one of the most reputable science journals in the world. Well, according to this article in Nature, the human body possesses 360 joints. Sorry, Nature magazine. You are 1,400 years late to this discovery because our prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, already told us that long time before you. Now the question is to you. Did he know that because he was a prophet? or because he had a secret research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century. In the past 50-60 years, the advancement in neuroscience was more than impressive. We started to understand the anatomy of our brains and some of the functions of each part. One of the discoveries was related to this part right here. Turns out one of its functions is planning, lying, and deceiving. So one of the main candidates is right about here, uh, right above your forehead, it's called the cingulate gyrus, involved in a lot of different functions. But what we find is that when we knock this area out or we remove this area, people no longer deceive and they don't deceive very well. You can also read about that in details in this book. Thanks to all of these scientists for their amazing work, but as Muslims, we already knew that 1,400 years ago. Allah condemned one of the lying, deceiving disbelievers in Surah Al-Alaq, saying, If he does not stop, I will certainly drag him with his nasiya. Nasiya is this part that I'm pointing at. Nasiya kathibatin khati'a as his nasiya is sinful of deceiving and lying. You can also find the same meaning in this hadith. Allahumma inni abduk, ibn abdik, ibn amatik, nasiyati biyadik, maadin fiya hukmuk, adlum fiya qadauk. Allah, I am your slave, the son of your slave. My nasiya, this part, is in your hands, so your decisions will be respected. 
and just is your judgment until the end of the dua. The important part for us now is my nasiya is in your hands. Therefore, all your commands will be obeyed. I cannot decide to reject, disbelieve, lie, or deceive. I will just hear and obey because this part of my brain is obedient to you. Subhanallah. So the question is still open. Did the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, get this as a revelation from God? Or did he have a secret research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? Disbelievers in Arabia in the 7th century claimed that it is impossible for Allah to recreate us after we die as we become dust. So Allah responded in Surah Al-Qiyamah, أيحسب الإنسان أن لن نجمع عظامه بلا قادرين على أن نسوي بنانا Do people think I cannot reassemble their bones? Indeed, I am most capable of perfectly restoring their own very fingertips. Can you imagine the confusion on the ancient disbeliever's face? Like there is a little cloud with a question mark above him. What a weird response. What is so significant about the tip of my fingers? Let's fast forward 1,000 years later, specifically to year 1788, when the German anatomist Johann Meyer was the first to conclude that fingerprints were unique to every individual. It was not until 1892 that fingerprints were used to solve a crime. Ah, now we can really understand and appreciate the verse. Do people think I cannot reassemble their bones? Indeed, I am most capable of perfectly restoring even their very fingertips. This is what it means. The question now is to you. Did Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, know that because he was a prophet? Or did he know that because he had a secret scientific research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? They say the most fatal burns are painless. According to Stanford Healthcare, in third degree burns, there are no sensation in the area since the nerve endings are destroyed. Based on that, burning someone in hellfire as a means of torture doesn't make any sense, as he will not feel any pain after a couple of seconds. What is the point of staying in hellfire for years if he will only feel pains for 2-3 seconds only? and then not feel anything after that, right? Check this out. Surat An-Nisa Al-Ladheena kafaru bi ayatina sawfa nuslihim nara Kullama nadijat juluduhum Baddalnaahum juludan ghayraha liyadhuqu al-adhaab Surely, those who reject our signs, we will cast them into the fire. Whenever their skins are burnt, we will replace it with flesh skin so that they can feel the pain. Indeed, Allah is almighty, always. Yep, we will replace their burnt skin with fresh skin so they can feel the pain. Without this fresh skin, they cannot feel the pain. Wait, there is one more. According to this hadith, the body of the disbeliever in hellfire is huge. He has a different body form than the one we have now. The thickness of his skin is 70 arms length, so he can feel the pain. 70 arms length of skin is a lot of pain before he gets a fresh new skin to feel even more pain. All of that just because he didn't answer the following question. Did our beloved prophet know that from God or did he have a secret scientific research center in the middle of the desert? in the 7th century. Only the one who gets the correct answer to this question can avoid having 70 arms length thickness to his skin burning in hellfire. Farming was the center of our civilizations for thousands of years, yet little did we know about the biology of these plants we grow and eat. For example, according to ResearchGate, Sex in plants was not discovered until the late 17th century. 
Before that, we didn't know that there were male and female plants. Well, I am sorry. I made a mistake. I shouldn't say we didn't know as humans. I mean only non-Muslims had no idea. Because Allah revealed this information to us long before that discovery. 1,400 years ago, Allah said in Surah Al-Shu'ara, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا إِلَى الْأَرْضِ كَمْ أَنْبَتْنَا فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ زَوْجٍ كَرِيمٍ Can't they see how many generous plants I created on earth in couples, male and female? Also Surah Luqman, we sent down water from the sky and grew generous plants in couples, male and female. Now the question is to you. Did Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, know that because he was a prophet? Or did he know that because he had a secret scientific research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? One more thing that is related to this discovery of plants being male and female. The process of pollination. If you are not familiar with the term, here is a quick explanation to what pollination is. Sexual reproduction in flowering plants requires male gametes, produced in pollen grains in the anthers, to fuse with female gametes found in the ovules. A pollen grain must reach the stigma before its nucleus can travel down towards the female gamete in the ovule. Pollination, the part we're covering in this video, is this step here. The movement of pollen from the anther to the stigma. This process is partly done with insects like bees or whatever, and it is also done by wind. Wind carries the pollen grains between flowers. This way plants can reproduce. Amazing how modern science helps humanity understand a lot about the world around them. Well, not all of us. Because for Muslims, Allah already revealed that information to us 1,400 years ago. Surat Al-Hijr وَأَرْسَلْنَا الْرِيَاحَ لَوَاقِحْ We sent down wind as pollinators. A pollinator is what helps carry the pollen from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower. Now the question is to you, did Muhammad peace and blessing be upon him know that because he was a prophet? Or did he know that because he had a secret scientific research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? Another fact in biology revealed by Allah that was impossible to prove before the advancement of science was the one in Surat Al-Anbiya. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيٍّ أَفَلَا يُؤْمِنُونَ We made from water every living thing. Will they not then believe? It was impossible to verify or deny because science estimate that there are around 8.7 million species in existence. And it is impossible for a man in a desert in the 7th century to check all of these millions of species around the world and make sure they are made of water. Also keep in mind living things like bacteria, which cannot be seen with the naked eye. Are they from water or not? Let's fast forward to the 21st century. Turns out what is common between all of these species is the fact that they consist of cells. And because every living cell is more or less 70% water, that also includes the bacteria itself, that makes all of these millions of species automatically from water. Even these scientists who are looking for life outside Earth, how are they looking for life? They are just looking for water. A flowing water on the surface of Mars, this finding, it's a game changer. Now water raises hope that the cold, dry, so-called red planet may sustain life. Scientists at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory say new images from the surface of Mars may hold evidence that flowing water exists on the planet. This means a lot for our quest for life outside of planet Earth. If it's confirmed, the finding could help immensely in the search for other forms of life in our solar system. Is to find flowing liquid water which can one day perhaps sustain life. That is because it is a fact now. Life equal water. Now you should ask yourself, in the middle of the ignorance of the 7th century, Back then, when people thought that it was hurtful to drink only water, you have to put wine on it, otherwise it will be bad for you. 
Yes, this is what they believed. Actually, this belief still exists until today. It is still in the Bible. Let's read it quickly. 2 Maccabees 50 For it is hurtful to drink always wine or to drink always water. How is it hurtful to drink always water? Anyway, in the middle of this ignorant society, how did he know all of this accurate information? Did he know it because he was a prophet? Or did he know it because he had a secret research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? One of the amazing benefits of modern science and modern medicine is we can take care of people who go into coma, sometimes for years, and give them a chance to recover and have a normal life later. Just 100 years ago, the same person would be considered dead already. Taking care of a patient in a coma is very difficult. There are a lot of things the professional staff in the hospital should take care of. We only need to talk about one of them. According to NHS Healthcare, staff should be moving the person regularly so they don't develop bed sores. And according to the Chicago Personal Injury Lawyers, bed sores can be deadly. Roughly 60,000 people in the United States die annually because of pressure injuries like bed sores. One of the blessings of Allah that we never thank Him for, by the way, is the unintentional moving and turning of our bodies while we are asleep. Without it, sleeping might be deadly to us. But the person who is in coma, unfortunately, does not have this ability. If the medical staff do not turn him regularly, he will have severe consequences. That reminds me of one story Allah revealed to us in Surah Al-Kahf. The miracle of the sleeper of the cave, when Allah caused those young men in the cave to sleep for a very long time, for years. In the end of the story, when they woke up, they didn't have any pressure sores. Which leads us to this specific verse. وَنُقَلِّبُهُمْ ذَاتَ الْيَمِينِ وَذَاتَ الشِّمَالِ We turn them over to the right and to the left throughout all of these years of sleeping. This small detail in the story was read by billions of Muslims throughout the past 1,400 years, without them having the chance to really appreciate the amazing sign behind it. The more we learn about the universe and ourselves, the more we discover the signs of Allah to us, and the more we have to come up with excuses not to believe. So ask yourself, did he know that because he was a prophet, or did he know that because he had a secret scientific research center in the middle of the desert? in the 7th century. Before I continue, I want to ask you a favor. As you can see, this information will be very, very helpful to people seeking the truth or seeking to strengthen their faith. And the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, whoever leads to good is like the one who does it. Help this video spread by engaging with it first with like and a comment, then share it on your social media. This way you share the reward with us, inshallah. Thank you. One of the things that fascinate me and eat away a good portion of my free time is watching National Geographic. Watching it, I learned that ants have their own language. They cooperate and communicate by secret pheromones. This one was also very funny. The rebellion of the ant slaves. Humans are not the only species that have had to deal with issue of slavery. Some species of ants also abduct the young of others, forcing them into laboring for their new masters. They usually carry their dead to a sort of a graveyard. They have jobs like us. They have managers, supervisors, foremen and workers. And they have their own marketplaces where they can exchange goods. Subhanallah. I learned that bees communicate. When a bee finds a flower, it communicates the location of this flower and how to reach it to other bees in a way called the bee dance. Bees also have sophisticated job structures like us. I also learned that dolphins and whales have their own language. Turns out all of these animals have communities like us. 
Wait a minute, where did I hear that before? Ah, Surah Al-An'am. وَمَا مِنْ دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا طَائِرٍ يَطِيرُ بِجَنَاحَيْهِ إِلَّا أُمَمٌ أَمْثَالَكُمْ All living beings roaming the earth and winged birds soaring in the sky are communities like yourselves. Those who deny our signs are willfully deaf and dumb, lost in darkness. Allah leaves whoever he wills to stray and guide whoever he wills to the straight way. Also in Surah An-Naml, Allah quotes a conversation between ants. قَالَتْ نَمْلَ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّمْلُ تَخُلُوا مَسَاكِلَكُمْ One ant said, O oh ants, go quickly into the homes so Solomon and his army will not crush you unknowingly. Before the advancement of human knowledge, Islamophobes took these verses as mockery, as people believed that ants have no brain and they don't communicate. But after this article in Science Magazine, shh, ants are talking, you don't hear them mocking anymore. So now you tell me, did he receive that as a revelation from Allah, the one who created the universe and ants? Or did he know that because he had a secret research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? Did you know that in the verse that we just read together, there was one word that caused a lot of problems for the early Muslims? Let's read it again together. Surah An-Naml حَتَّى إِذَا أَتَوْا عَلَى وَادِ النَّمْلِ قَالَتْ نَمْلَ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّمْلُ دُخُلُوا مَسَاكِنَكُمْ As the army approached the valley of ants, one female ant said, O oh, ants, go quickly into your homes. The key word here is قَالَتْ it translates to she said, and it cannot be interpreted otherwise. The problem was due to the lack of knowledge. In the 7th century, people assumed that the workers in every species should be male, as the worker ant does all the heavy lifting and labor, so logically it must be the male. This is what we're used to in our species at least. But the verse in the Quran very clearly says the opposite of what everyone expects. That was a source of mockery from disbelievers and Islamophobes until we finally learned the following. According to Harvard University, in ants, the workers are female. When Allah said it, they mocked us. But when Harvard University said it, we don't hear them mocking anymore. So now you tell me, did he know that because he was a prophet? Or did he know that because he had a secret research center? in the middle of the desert in the 7th century. Another verse that also caused a lot of issues was the one in Surah An-Nahl. وَأَوْحَى رَبُّكَ إِلَى النَّحْلِ أَنِ اتَّخِذِي مِنَ الْجِبَالِ بِيُوتًا وَمِنَ الشَّجَرِ وَمِمَّا يَعْرُشُونَ ثُمَّ كُلِي مِنْ كُلِّ الثَّمَرَاتِ فَاسْلُكِي سُبُولَ رَبِّكِ ذُلُولًا your Lord inspired the female bee. Make your homes in the mountains, the trees, and whatever people construct. And feed from the flower and any fruit you please. And follow the ways of your Lord, he made easy for you. The key words here are as follows. Ittakhidhi, kuli, fasluki. All of them are female verbs that cannot be interpreted otherwise. That means that the worker bee should be female. And the problem was due to the lack of knowledge in the 7th century, people assumed that the workers of every species are male. The worker bee that does all the heavy lifting and labor logically must be male as that is what we are used to in our species. But the verse in the Quran very clearly says the opposite of what everyone expected. This verse was also a source of a lot of mockery from disbelievers and Islamophobes until we learned the following. According to Arizona State University, worker bees are all female. Their job includes the following. Cleaners, nurses, builders, honey makers, pollen collectors, nectar collectors, and guarders. Because they work so hard during the busy season, worker bees live only about six weeks. When Allah said it, they mocked. But when Arizona State University said it, you don't hear them mocking anymore. So the question is to you now. 
Did he know that from God? Or did he know that because he had a secret research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? One of the species that really make you wonder is the spider. This is a quick time lapse of a spider building its home. The amount of effort it puts into building is impressive. And in the end, the result is amazing. What if I tell you that this spider that you were watching was a female spider? The spider that put all of this effort into building the house was female. Would you believe me? Well, it turns out that even though males can make silk and can build houses, most of the time they leave their webs in search for females. And for the female, she builds her house and to lure in the mate, she can make her webs more attractive. Now imagine telling that to ignorant people in the 7th century. Telling them that the female spider builds her own house. This is exactly what Allah did in Surah Al-Ankabut. كَمَثَلِ الْعَنْكَبُوتِ اتَّخَذَتْ بَيْتًا Like the female spider when she builds a house. The key word here is اتَّخَذَتْ which is a female verb that cannot be interpreted otherwise. And due to the lack of knowledge in the 7th century, people assumed the workers of every species to be male. The house builder spider that does all the heavy lifting and labor logically must be male as that is what we're used to in our species. It was very hard for them to understand that female spiders could build their houses too. But now, after we had the knowledge to verify this fact, will you believe he had this as a revelation from God? Or will you claim he had a secret research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? One more interesting thing about the house of the spider. Allah said in the same verse in Surah Al-Ankabut, وَإِنَّ أَوْهَنَ الْبِيُوتِ لَبَيْتُ الْعَنْكَبُوتِ The flimsiest of all homes is the home of the spider. Well, this is not surprising at all because the home of the spider is very weak. It doesn't shield against rain or against the sun or anything really. It can easily be destroyed by a passing animal or even by wind. But there is a catch. When we refer to a home as a fragile home, we usually mean that the family ties are broken or the family relationship is fragile. A fragile home is the home where the husband is cheating on his wife, for example. Or a fragile home is where kids don't respect their parents and so on. This is what we usually mean by a fragile home, at least in the Arabic culture. So is the home of the spider fragile in that sense too? Mm, let's see. According to CBC, female spiders may be able to adjust their webs to make them appear more sexually attractive to male spiders. Then after the male comes to her web and they meet, she just kills him. Yes, that's it. That is the whole family structure. According to NBC News, in many spider species, females eat the males after sex. Some males successfully run away though, before they get eaten. I'm sure a lot of wives today are happy to hear that. But jokes aside, isn't that the most fragile family structure ever? It is even more fragile than the family structure promoted by the liberal West. And I am still waiting for the answer to the same question. Did he know all that? because he was a prophet? Or did he have a secret research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? Allah said in Surah Al-Baqarah, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَحِي أَنْ يَضْرِبَ مَثَلًا مَا بَعُوضَةً فَمَا فَوْقَهَا Surely Allah does not shy away from using a parable of a mosquito or what is above it. This verse is basically saying, if you are a sincere person looking for evidence of the existence of God, one mosquito will be enough proof for you. Our brothers in People of Islam made an amazing explanation of that verse. Let's watch it together first. The mosquito egg is always laid in water. 
As the mother lays her eggs, she sticks them together into an array to form a raft structure to stop them from sinking. From there, the eggs turn into larvae that swim around upside down on the surface of the water whilst breathing through a tube, a bit like a snorkel. The larvae then turn into pupae and then break out as adults with the ability to fly instantly. This small insect that has hatched is currently the deadliest animal in the world. Ever wondered why they have extremely fast reflexes? Well, that's because the mosquito has a pair of compound eyes. Each compound eye is made up of hundreds of mini eyes called lenses that curve around. Each lens takes an image at a different angle which its brain processes. For this reason, the mosquito can see almost everything happening around it at any given time without having to turn around. Physicists have been fascinated by this and have been trying to copy this system to develop self-driving cars, drones and safety cameras to say the least. The mosquito uses carbon dioxide sensors to detect your breath from up to 50 meters away. Once it finds its way into your room, it detects heat from your body to land exactly where it will start to suck your blood. This is how they see you in the dark when you are asleep. Amazingly, the mosquito uses six needles to suck blood in a highly sophisticated manner. First, it removes a protective layer to expose the needles. Then it uses the sharp teeth on the outside two needles to drill through your skin, like a saw. The two inner needles hold the cut open whilst the middle two probe around to find a blood vessel. Once a blood vessel is found, one of the probe needles spits chemicals to numb the pain and help your blood to flow. The other probe needle acts like a straw and starts sucking your blood. As it sucks, its body separates the water and squeezes it out of its back to pack in as many nutrients as possible. Sounds like a surgical operation, right? This is an image of the mosquito's foot. It is made up of a complex array of features that protect it and allow it to land on many different surfaces such as water to feed its eggs. As for its wings, the mosquito flaps them about 1000 times every single second to help it fly. It is clear that this tiny creature we can barely see with the naked eye is packed with many efficient systems allowing it to function and breed. Amazing, subhanallah. But wait, there is something we completely forgot about. The verse says, The parable of a mosquito or what is above it. What is above it? Well, according to Science Direct, the same way we are annoyed every day by mosquitoes attaching to our skin, a mosquito also gets annoyed by tiny mites that attach to it. Check this picture for example. Also according to MDPI, there are water mites that prey on and parasitize mosquitoes. No way those mites can be observed or studied by the naked eye. Yet the verse still says, The parable of a mosquito or what is above it. So the question still stands, did he know that because he was a prophet? Or did he know that because he had a secret research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? Let me remind you once more. This information might be an eye-opener to someone who is in desperate need of guidance. Someone who is sincerely looking for God. Don't miss your opportunity to share the reward with us by helping the video spread as much as possible. You also have our permission to download it and re-upload it to your channel or to your social media accounts. It's copyright free. Thanks for your help and let's continue. Now let's talk a little bit about some health recommendations from Quran and Hadith. According to this verse in Surah An-Nahl and also according to this Hadith and finally this Hadith. There is a great emphasis on the health benefits of honey and its ability to prevent diseases. 
as it was recommended by the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him over other healing choices. Before the latest advancements in medicine and human knowledge, we could not really understand how and why. But now, this is what we know. According to Healthline, it is a good source of antioxidants. It has all of this nutritional value. It has antibacterial properties. It heals wounds. It is a phytonutrients powerhouse. It helps for digestive issues. It soothes sore throat and cough. And it has brain benefits. Other food that is sunnah to eat is dates. That is because of this hadith. When you break your fast, break it with dates. And here is what we've discovered so far about the health benefits of dates. According to Healthline, dates have an excellent nutritional profile. This nutrition list looks like the back of a multivitamin pill container. Dates are a great way to increase your fiber intake. They are high in disease-fighting antioxidants. They may promote brain health, promote natural labor, good source of fructose, and they have potential to prevent bone-related conditions and potential to help with blood sugar regulation. Thank God for all of these benefits, and thank God for pointing out these benefits for us as early as the 7th century, instead of missing out on all of them until the advancement of science in the 21st century when we discovered it. So the question is still open. Did he know that because he was a prophet? Or did he know that because he had a secret research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? The prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, Sumu tasihu. If you fast, you will be healthier. People back then didn't really understand how is fasting related to health. It seems like the opposite because you get super tired when you fast. Sometimes for 16 hours, sometimes for 17 hours. How is that related to health? And even if you don't get tired, what's the point? You just eat in the evening instead of eating in the morning. So how will that make our health better? So what Muslims did is they believed in the hadith of the Prophet as a fact. Why? Because the Prophet said it. But no one could really understand how or why. Until the advancement of science and human knowledge. Instead of me telling you the benefits, let's hear Dr. Eric Berg explain it for us. When you do fasting, you actually decrease what's called cytokines. There are different types of cytokines. And cytokines are chemical messages that communicate between your immune cells. There are certain cytokines that cause inflammation, and those are the ones that we're talking about. So it'll decrease the trigger to inflammation. Also, it will stimulate something called macrophages. A macrophage is a large cell that eats bacteria and microbes and viruses. This is like a professional, what's called a phagocyte, which not just is like a garbage disposal, but it is a deadly killer and a, one of the first lines of defense for any type of an invasion for microbes. So the more you can stimulate macrophages, the better the immune system. All right, next thing is it will increase the microbiome. What is the microbiome? That describes your friendly microbes in your body that help you. A great majority of your immune system, and I'm talking like 70%, is located in your large intestine. And I'm talking about the microbiome, which I did a video on, and I'll put that link down below, gives you incredible immune support. And without it, your risk for infection goes straight up and vertical. When you do fasting, which is kind of weird because you're actually kind of starving them, they live longer. There's certain type of genetic things that get triggered that support your immune system. Next thing is resistance to stress. When you fast, you increase your capacity to fight off stress, as well as DNA damage too. Also, when you fast, you decrease oxidative stress. You're going to have less free radicals. You're also going to get an increase in production 
of your antioxidant networks, which also can help as well. And lastly, fasting will increase autophagy, which is your body's ability to recycle old damaged parts as well as microbes. There's a very specific type of autophagy called xenophagy, which targets pathogens. One huge benefit of fasting is basically the elimination of these microbes that can stay dormant in your body for many, many years. Of course, you may need to research all the points he talked about on your own to fully understand them. You can find his full video on his channel, My Opinion on Fasting Ramadan. But wait, there is more. Let's listen to it. Now, intermittent fasting is the most important and most magical thing you can do for your body. But the question is why? What does intermittent fasting do? Well, number one, it actually increases your white blood cells. It strengthens your immune system. It increases stem cells with your immune system. So it can revive and give you a new immune system if it's been damaged. It powerfully suppresses inflammation. So if you have arthritis, bursitis, tendonitis, any of the itises, those are going to go bye-bye. It is a powerful stimulator of something called autophagy, which is the recycling of old damaged proteins, your skin, your hair, your nails, your organs. It is one of the most powerful stimulators of growth hormone. Growth hormone is all about fat burning. It's all about anti-aging and exercise only will increase growth hormone by like, I don't know, 750%. Fasting can increase growth hormone by 2000%. So why would anyone even hesitate from doing intermittent fasting? It can increase testosterone by 180%. It greatly improves your mood. So let's say you have depression or anxiety, or you're not feeling that great. It can bring your emotions up to a whole new level. So you feel more like yourself. I mean, that alone is huge. Intermittent fasting helps regrow your brain cells. So your cognitive function improve, memory, concentration, focus. It is very, very beneficial, if not essential for people with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia. And the best way to kill cancer cells in the shrink tumors is fasting. So there's so many different epigenetic uh, factors in relationship to cancer. One, is that it helps to recycle old damaged mitochondria. And the reason why that's really important is because what causes cancer is damage within the mitochondria. So if you can recycle and fix all the broken mitochondria, you can really not just prevent cancer, but you can help to uh, slow it down. And so one term related to that is not called autophagy, it's mitophagy. But beyond that, I think the biggest and coolest thing that fasting can do for someone is fix a broken metabolism. So if you have a slow metabolism, it can give you a fast metabolism. If you have this situation where you can only lose a certain amount because you hit this set point, it can help bust through that and help you lose more and more because it fixes insulin resistance. And if you don't believe him, you can also consult Dr. Jin Sang about the benefits of fasting. Intermittent fasting basically activates certain proteins that regulate cellular function. So there's a protein called FOXO, and this is the protein that will help suppress tumors. So it has tumor suppression action, therefore minimizing or uh, improving uh, can cancer outcome, right? PGC1-alpha. This is where the energy is produced, right? We're talking about mitochondrial biogenesis. It actually uh, creates more mitochondria, improving cellular energy. And it's also remodeling of tissues. So there is a process called autophagy or autophagy, where there's gonna be cleaning up of cellular debris, right? In our body. And it's a great way to remodel some of our tissue. And it also, um, it's a metabolism regulation um, uh, protein. So it improves um, a calorie burning uh, capabilities, basically improves that sluggish uh, body where you feel tired all the time. So you have more energy, you have more mitochondria, and more function. NRF2, this is the protein that helps reduce inflammation. 
right? It's anti-inflammatory effects. So it helps cardiovascular function, uh, reduces water retention, uh, reduces chronic disease, and so forth, because you're minimizing inflammatory processes in our body. We can actually go on and on talking about the health benefits of fasting. Or you can just take this two words from our beloved Prophet peace and blessing be upon him. Sumo tasahu. Fast and you will be healthy. So the question is still open. Did he know that because he was a prophet? Or did he have a secret research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? One day the prophet peace and blessing be upon him saw a man sleeping on his stomach. The prophet hated that and told him don't sleep in that position again. This sleeping position is hated by Allah Azza wa Jal. What Muslims did is they heard and obeyed as usual. But there was always that question, how is that benefiting us? We kept waiting for the answer to this question for years until we finally got the knowledge. According to Mayo Clinic, sleeping on your stomach places a strain on your back and spine. This is because most of your weight is in the middle of your body. This makes it difficult to maintain a neutral spine position when you are sleeping. Also over time, neck problems can develop. Also very harmful to pregnant moms to be. And they went on to explain. They gave a whole explanation about it. Yes, the spine, heavy, bony structure, heaviest one in your whole body. When you sleep on your stomach, everything in front of it is soft tissue, soft organs. Your, your intestines, your stomach, your lungs, all of this is soft. So what happens is that this, the spine sags downwards. And this is what contributes to the exaggerated what they call lumbar curvature of the spine. You old people, they're walking around their backs so like, this is from this. Yeah, they pointed it out. I'm sure after all of these discoveries and articles in medical magazines, people now stopped sleeping on their stomachs to take care of their health, of course. But we as Muslims were lucky enough to stop doing that 1,400 years ago. So the question is still open. Did he know that because he was a prophet or did he have a secret research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? According to Time magazine, more than half of the world will be obese by 2035. This is a catastrophe because we learned from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention that people who are overweight are at high risk of death, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, gallbladder disease, joint issues, breathing problems, and many types of cancer. Obesity is also associated with the leading causes of death. Thanks to modern research in medicine, we understand these risks now, and we are overwhelmed by educational content advertising us to manage our food intake. This modern knowledge did not exist 100-200 years ago, unfortunately. Or did it? Because before the modern era, this knowledge was exclusive only to Muslims for hundreds of years. They learned it from the teachings of our beloved Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. You cannot fill up a container that will be more evil and harmful than filling up your stomach. حسب ابن آدم أكلات يقمن صلبة. A few bites will be enough for you. Don't eat until you're full. And according to this hadith, the maximum you should be filling is only one third of your stomach. إني لا آكل متكئا. I don't eat while sitting in a comfortable position to avoid overeating. المؤمن يأكل في معي واحد والكافر يأكل في سبعة أمعاء. If the disbeliever fills seven stomachs, a believer should only fill one. And Allah said in Surah Al-A'raf, وَكُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُسْرِفِينَ Eat and drink, but without excess. 
Allah does not like those who overconsume. I guess the message is delivered. So the question is to you now. Did he know all of that because he was a prophet? Or did he have a secret medical research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? This is fresh new. According to BBC, sugar gel helps premature babies. A door of sugar is given as gel rubbed into the inside of the cheek as a cheap and effective way to protect premature babies against brain damage, says experts. You can read more on your own time to understand how this small amount of sugar protects babies from brain damage. But for now, I need to thank these amazing scientists for their effort in research that will help protect our health and the health of our children. Because in the past, this benefit was exclusive only to Muslims as they learned it already from our beloved Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. According to this hadith, and also this hadith, it is sunnah to take a piece of date that is high in sugar content and rub it into the inside of the cheek of a newborn. Muslims did that to every newborn for more than a thousand years. They didn't do that because of the modern discovery in medicine. They took this advice from Allah himself through our Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. So now you tell me, did he know that because he was a prophet? Or did he have a secret medical research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? If you compare the results of pandemics in the past and the results of the last one we already witnessed together, you will be very proud of the knowledge that we have accumulated in disease prevention and control. Pandemics in history, like the plague or the Spanish flu, resulted in the death of an imaginable number of people that reached a percentage of the people living on Earth back then. But now, alhamdulillah, and thanks to the amazing work of doctors and scientists working in research and spreading knowledge, we actually learned the importance of hygiene, segregation, and sometimes full lockdowns to prevent the spreading of the virus. Humanity in the past didn't know that. Or did they? Well, I know one person who gave us all the advice we are learning from the World Health Organization right now. He just said the same thing, but 1,400 years ago. Let's start with the hygiene first, then the disease control. According to this hadith, Every believer is obligated to wash his face, his nose, even from the inside, his mouth, his ears, his head, his full arms and legs a minimum of five times per day. According to this hadith, every believer should brush his teeth several times per day. According to this hadith, every believer should take a full shower minimum one time per week that is in addition to a full shower after every physical relationship. According to this hadith, the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, used the right hand for eating, handshaking people, anything that is clean. And used the left hand for anything that is unclean, like for example, cleaning after bathroom. And ordered everyone in the community to do the same. If you think about it, that was a brilliant way to prevent the spread of disease, especially before the invention of soap. According to this hadith, believers should cover their mouths if they sneeze. And finally, according to this hadith, if a pandemic happen and it is spreading in another city, don't go there. Yeah, makes sense. But if a pandemic happened and it is spreading in your city, don't run away. Don't get out of the city. Stay and even if you die, Allah will reward you with shahada. This last one was the most impressive ordering a full lockdown on a city in a case of pandemic. Who could guess that in the 7th century? So now you tell me, did he know all of that because he was a prophet? Or did he have a secret access to the World Health Organization in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? Allah said in Surah Fussalat, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ 
we will show them our signs in the universe and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that this Quran is the truth. If you want more information about what we talked about in this video, write in the comments or join our Discord and let's have a real conversation. Link is in the description. And if you want more evidence of Islam and more miracles of the Quran and Sunnah, check out this playlist. I'm sure you'll love it. And remember, brothers and sisters, that the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, deliver my message even if all you can deliver is one verse. So, don't let this video stop with you. Help it spread by engaging with it with a like and comment and sharing it on your social media account. Thanks and salam alaikum. الحمد لله وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى آه الله خير أم ما يشركون أم من خلق السماوات والأرض وأنزل لكم من السماء فأنبتنا به حدائق ذات بهجة ما كان لكم أن تنبتوا شجرها أإله مع الله أإله مع الله أم من خلق السماوات والأرض وأنزل لكم من السماء ماء فأنبتنا به حدائق ذات بهجة ما كان لكم أن تنبتوا شجرها أإله مع الله بل هم قوم يعدلون أمن جعل الأرض قرارا وجعل خلالها أنهارا وجعل لها رواسي وجعل بين البحرين حاجزا أإله مع الله بل أكثرهم لا يعلمون أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء ويكشف السوء ويجعلكم خلفاء الأرض أإله مع الله أإله مع الله قليلا ما تذكرون أم في ظلمات البر والبحر ومن يرسل الرياح بشرا بين يدي رحمته أإله مع الله تعالى الله عما يشركون